How about now? That's a little better. Yeah. Point. Go close. Uh, like I said, thank you all for coming. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, some upcoming announcements for programs. On Sunday, the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogy Society uh, will be having a program with Charles Kaufman, and he will be presenting on Pennsylvania German language heritage. On August 28th, uh, we'll have our bookmark book club uh, with Jim LaFleur, and we'll be talking about nine months in Yorktown. On September 7th, we'll have Writer's Roundtable with Samantha Dorn, uh, who is also our presenter tonight. And uh, he'll be talking about paved over prominence. And on September 9th is our second Saturday with Charles Stambaugh, and he'll be talking about Hanover's Forest Park. On September 14th, we'll have our annual members meeting and awards ceremony. And lastly, on September 20th, we'll have our Civil War Roundtable with Matthew Borders, and he'll be presenting the Gamble of 1862, the Maryland Campaign. And for more information on any of these programs and to register, you can visit our website at yorkhistorycenter.org. And now uh, all vets would like to welcome Samantha Dorm from Friends of Lebanon Cemetery. Sorry. Thank you. If you just give me just a moment, I'm going to get my notes up here and I will make sure that I pull the mic closer to me as well. It's not that I don't know the information, it's just that there's so much information um, that we have about veterans at Lebanon Cemetery. How's the sound there? All right, excellent. Uh, so my name is Samantha Dorm. I am born and raised here in York, Pennsylvania. Uh, and um, I started volunteering at Lebanon Cemetery, which is located in North York, uh, back in 2019. Uh, so we do want to thank our newest uh, council member for North York for being here tonight. Uh, North York Borough has been uh, a great partner with us as we try and get things taken care of at Lebanon Cemetery. So what you have on the screen here, at the very bottom, I think this is very important, and it says, even in death, there was segregation. So I want you to think about that throughout the presentation. Even in death, there was segregation. So Lebanon Cemetery was formed in 1872. Why? Anyone? I'm, I'm more of a conversational type of presenter, so that you know. There's no wrong answer. The reason was that people that looked like me wanted to have an opportunity to bury their loved ones with dignity and respect. It was that simple. But because of segregation, not just in York County, but throughout the country, African-Americans, including our veterans, could not be buried, even in the National Cemetery after the Civil War. At Lebanon Cemetery, go to the next slide, please, here. We have over 300 veterans at Lebanon Cemetery, a minimum of 30 confirmed USCT Civil War. I have some of those names here. You notice I said minimum. It is extremely difficult to track the records, not just from the Civil War, but from any uh, movement probably up until, I would say about the 1950s and even into the 1960s with trying to obtain records. And so we are constantly adding to, correcting some of the information that is on this screen uh, was from 2019. And that was using a file here from the York County History Center. Numerous Civil War veterans are interred at Lebanon Cemetery, as well as five service members who served uh, during the Spanish-American War. 
And then we have many others that serve the country uh, in later service. So you can imagine with over 300 people in 35, 40 minutes or less, we're only going to hit a few today. Um, so we're just going to be directing folks then to our website, to our Facebook page, uh, as well as when it comes to the Civil War. Um, I did a presentation here at the History Center, I believe it was back in April for the Civil War Roundtable, and that information is available on the History Center's YouTube page. Uh, so you can go to that page. Next slide, please. Now this has to do with our veterans, with York County as a whole. Uh, so when we were pulling information about the USCT, I just mentioned about the uh, History Center and some of the files. I put a screenshot here at the bottom. If you go online, with the York County History Center, they do have a Civil War collection. And then a subset of the Civil War collection is a file that's listed for the United States Colored Troops from York County. So that information is public and I invite and encourage everyone to go to the York County History Center uh, website. For York County, this is just for the Civil War, over 300 black men from York County enlisted in the Army and Navy regiments. They served in 20 different regiments. They're varied. Here in York County, we have six known African-American cemeteries. Lebanon Cemetery is the largest that we have. We also have out in Wrightsville, as well as uh, several down in the southern part of York County. It's very possible that there is another Black cemetery up in the area of Newberry Town. We're trying to track down based off of some newspaper articles that we've been able to find. And I'm going to warn you guys right now, when we do these presentations, I use the terminology from the time period that was used at that time. And so when we are trying to find people and we are looking at records, I'm using search words for color, Negro, or that cemetery that we're looking for in Newberry Town. They refer to it as Darkie Hill. That's all that we know. Uh, so you'll hear me using those words throughout. So I kind of put that out there. Uh, next slide, please. On the very first slide that I had up today, this picture was there. And I wanted to come back to this to give you a little bit of information about what we do at Lebanon Cemetery. Since 2019, our volunteers have uncovered over 800 of what we refer to as the flat markers. It's that small one here at the bottom that looks like a cinder block with just a nameplate on. This particular marker was several feet underground. We located this with metal detector, and then we dug this out. So the only information that we knew was James B. Brown, year of birth, year of death. And so for many of our veterans, and why our list keeps changing, is because after we dig them out and we reset them. We put drainage rock under so that they're hopefully not going to sink um, as fast. Uh, it, it really is just kind of a, a stopgate measure temporary uh, until we have some additional funding. But we take pictures of the stone. Uh, we put them into free databases so that the families can come and find them. One of those databases, which is Billion Graves, it's GPS recognized. So we have the coordinates, the last known coordinate of where that stone was when the picture was taken. So if they sink again, at least we can find them. Um, but that also allows family members to use that app for free, come to the cemetery, put in the name, and it will walk you to where that picture was taken, okay? So the next step of what our volunteers are doing, we will then utilize things such as ancestry.com as well as newspapers.com. 
And oftentimes it's in the obituary that we'll see that one little line that this person served in a branch of the military. And that will then lead to the next search of going about trying to find their military records. What we found here with Mr. Talley, going to the next slide, James Brent Brown Talley is interred in Lebanon Cemetery. This was a post that we put up in May of 2021. So we put this information out to the public, trying to find family, trying to find more information. And this just happened to be on Memorial Day that we wanted to recognize Mr. James Brent Brown Talley. He was killed in action on February 1st of 1970 in Vietnam. He was age 20 at the time. Mr. Talley lived at 150 South Penn Street in York, Pennsylvania. His mother, Marie Talley, requested a military marker on February 8th of 1970. At the time when this post went up, he still did not have a military marker. His temporary marker, which was shown in the previous slide, had been uncovered by volunteers in 2019. And he was also a Purple Heart awardee recipient. After his mother ordered his stone, she passed away the same year. So there was no one to receive or to ensure that it was placed. Last year, our volunteers working with the York County Department of Veterans Affairs was able to get, finally, his military marker. His and 11 other individuals. The, uh, the other 11 all have the upright markers, and we had a dedication ceremony last November. The picture you see here for the first time, his family members being able to come to the cemetery as we honor James Brecht, Brown's house. That's what we do. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that we've been coming to the cemetery since 2019. And when we first started coming out, we would always reference it as, you know, cleanup day. And then we got a little bit smarter because not many people want to come and clean things up month over month. So when we turned, changed our mindset into preservation, now we have committed volunteers and always looking for more. So in addition to changing to preservation, we also really embarked on storytelling. Who are these people? What did they do? Who were they related to? And being able to connect families through the cemetery records. I'm a grant writer. That's what I do for a living. And I knew that there was funding out there uh, for historic black cemeteries. One of those sources of funding that we were pursuing was coming through the Department of Veterans Affairs. And they have a program, uh, which is a veterans legacy program. And they were offering a significant amount of money to be able to tell the story of veterans in cemeteries. And last year, they were prioritizing black and brown veterans. And then the next bullet point said, in the national cemetery or one of the state funded military cemeteries. Why might that be a problem? Lebanon is not one of them. Lebanon is not one of them. I had to call to Washington, D.C. and say to them, we're not in your cemeteries. There was segregation. So we weren't eligible because the only eligible sites were those funded by Veterans Affairs. So interestingly enough, here in York County, um, we do have one cemetery in York County, and that's Prospect Hill. 
And so um, you're probably familiar with the Court of Valor. Certainly their program is coming up. I believe it's September 17th. If you haven't been, I encourage you to come. It's a phenomenal program. Um, so at Lebanon Cemetery, we have one person, a gentleman by the name of Greenberry S. Robinson. And Greenberry S. Robinson served with the 87th Infantry. He was the only Black member. Um, he was their cook as well as acting uh, many times as, as the medic. Other members of the 87th are in Prospect Hill. So we can go after the grant and we can tell the story of all the members except for Greenberry because he's less than a mile away. The problem, because they serve together. That led to a relationship with the Department of Veterans Affairs. I'm a little bit persistent. <laughs> and so this past January, Martin Luther King Day, we uh, here in York, Pennsylvania, we posted the Secretary, the United States Secretary of Veterans Affairs, the Under Secretary, the Pennsylvania Secretary of Veterans Affairs, several dignitaries came to the cemetery for a tour and a program that we held at Messiah uh, there and in uh, North York. They were our host site. And we kicked off a new program. That program is known as Grace for Veterans. So it's Gravestone Recovery, getting those, finding those graves uh, and, and being able to put in our veterans markers. And then, and community engagement. The community engagement piece is the storytelling. And so part of this now is to work with AmeriCorps all across the country to take care of veterans in private cemeteries. Notice I do not say only black veterans. Believe it or not, for all of our veterans in the United States, only about 17% are in a veteran cemetery. So if you're in a private cemetery, we'll make sure not only that you receive what you earned for free, that headstone, the flag holder, as well as other attributes that can come with that, but also then to maintain it, to make sure that they remain clean, they remain upright, and that it is a place of honor. So we now will be working, already working, with cemeteries all across the country. And I wake up to emails from uh, Veterans Affairs, even from, I think one was from Guam. Um, we've had Alaska, we've had uh, Florida, and this is the movement. We're going to take care of our veterans. When the secretary was here, some of the words that he wanted to talk about because of the acknowledgement that not just in our cemeteries, but also the many years of segregated troops. And then after that, how we work with uh, members, black and brown community, when it comes to veterans affairs, access to benefits, making sure that everyone is receiving equal treatment. So part of his words here, and I, I do have his full speech, um, is on our Facebook page, as well as on the National Cemetery Administration's uh, website. So he says here, we are working to right the wrongs and to ensure we're combating institutional racism and discrimination rather than perpetuating it. We're going to keep this country's fundamental promises to Black vets and to all vets. That's why we're here, right? All vets. At times of challenge and controversy. We're going to keep doing the work and to keep bending that arc towards progress because they deserve the best and we can never give them anything less. So we have the commitment from the Department of Veterans Affairs in Washington, D.C. to take care of our veterans in private cemeteries throughout the country moving forward. 
Next slide, please. Gold Star families. Again, I trust many of you are probably familiar with those terms. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of our Gold Star families um, that we have at Lebanon Cemetery. And so the first year, Charles E. Williams, you may be familiar with the uh, American Legion, uh, the Charles E. Williams American Legion post. Now I do know that within the past year, the post name has changed. So there is no longer a Charles E. Williams post. It is just American Legion 127, uh, but they are trying to maintain and capture his history and make sure that he is not forgotten. Charles E. Williams is interred in Lebanon Cemetery, but he was one of six brothers who served during World War II. It was Charles, Samuel, Harvey, Curtis, Roscoe, and Gordon. Charles E. Williams served in the 92nd Division, a unit of Black soldiers who were fighting in Italy just less than two months before the end of the war in the European theater. He was killed in action on March 21st, 1945, and he was buried initially in Italy. I believe it was probably about 14 months later when his body was brought back to the United States. And I remember reading some newspaper articles where I think it was at Hannah Penn, but they, they had remembrance ceremonies for him. He was uh, a graduate of uh, the city school district. And so uh, I just noticed the difference in the date from when he was killed to when he was buried at Lebanon Cemetery and started doing a little bit more uh, background information to kind of figure out you know, how or what happened. Uh, there's additional information available uh, about Charles E. Williams on the York blog site, which is a part of uh, the York Daily Record. Jim McClure has done a wonderful job of helping us capture these stories and get the information out. Um, before I move on, any questions or, or comments as it relates to Gold Star families? Did anyone here serve during World War II? No? Okay. So moving on to the next, in addition to, next slide please, in addition to the Williams family, we also had the Carter family. Uh, they also were uh, students at William Penn Senior High School. Again, six sons with the Carter family. I have here February 13, 1945. Uh, we have uh, Mrs. Carter is visiting with her son, Lloyd, at his graduation ceremony at Tuskegee. He was a Tuskegee Airman. You can go on the Tuskegee Airmen website and you will see his information there. Uh, but this was his photo from graduation was February of 1945. By June of the same year, Lieutenant Lloyd Arthur Carter, son of Mr. and Mrs. John W. Carter of Rafton Road, died in an airplane crash near Waterboro, South Carolina. He was 18 years old, seven months and 25 days. They held his service at Bethel AME Church. The picture that you see here is what his stone used to look like. Our volunteers come out with a soft brush and water. We scrub the stones. We clean them up one by one. And then we use the same materials that they use at the National Cemetery, which is D2. We don't give that to all of the volunteers. We've gone through you know, different trainings and things on that line. So we're very specific in who we allow to do that. But just getting folks to come out, that's all it is, a soft brush and water. And one by one, we clean these stones so that they shine again worthy of the sacrifice. 
I never want the story to be this person died and that's it. There was so much more to individuals. So on the next slide, I wanted to make sure here that we were able to share a little bit more about Lieutenant Lloyd Arthur Carter, who was killed in a plane crash June 12, 1945 in South Carolina. Well, he was born in 1925. In June of 1936, we have a newspaper article where Lloyd Carter was one of 200 people at the Spring Garden Township, uh, in Spring Garden Township, excuse me, who were guests of J.W. Richley at the York Theater as a reward for being on the dental honor roll. So Mr. Uh, Richley paid for the students to be able to go and see a show at the theater. So we've had little newspaper clippings where it talks about now his life. In February of 1939, Lloyd Carter, then a student at Mount Road Junior High School, signed up for an intramural table tennis tournament. He was also a stage manager of the Thanksgiving Day program at the school that year. From 1940 to 1941 school year, Lloyd was assigned to homeroom 201 at the Mount Rose Junior High School. His teacher, was Harold, Harold C, excuse me, Harold R. Schreiber. And then I found some of the names of his classmates. Classmates included Charles Hess, Robert Huffman, Robert Kleinitz, Donald Metzel, Carlos Moose, Donald Reisinger, John Wagner, and Robert Ziegler. Again, tying him to people. He's not just someone who died in an airplane crash. The 1941 to 1942 school year, Lloyd received an award for distinguishing himself in athletics and other extracurricular activities. On June 11th of 1942, he received his promotion certificate to advance to high school. In 1943, the Historical Society of York, now the York County History Center, hosted Lloyd and 54 students of the William Penn High School uh, history classes. They came to inspect some of the collections that were on display here. And you'll see in the picture that Lloyd Carter was one of 12 students who enrolled in an aviation cadet for the Air Corps at that time. Uh, while he was still in high school. And so when I was reading through the information, it, it basically said that they had to then enter the Corps either after graduation or upon their 18th birthday, whichever came first. Okay, so this picture, uh, and you'll see him, the 12 young men that joined the Aviation Corps while still in the high school. Second Lieutenant Lloyd Carter visited his home in Spring Garden Township in March of 1945 after receiving his commission as a fighter pilot. He was killed in a plane crash in June of that same year. That's who he was. That's who we remember. That's who we honor. Next slide, please. You might notice a familiar name. On the screen, dorm. This is my grandfather. This is my pop. And uh, my grandfather passed away when I was 10 years old. No one had ever discussed that he served in the military. It was never talked about. Now, full disclosure, my father was one year old when he was in the service. So I came across this picture in a photo album from my dad's house. And I said, Pop was in a service? And my father just kind of said, well, yeah, because he didn't know really anything about it. It wasn't discussed. So I went looking. <laughs> One of the things that I found was a newspaper clipping 
where it wasn't just Pop, but two of his brothers. So up in the corner here, I took out this newspaper clipping and it says Sergeant Emery Dorn, son of Mrs. Catherine Dorn of 119. These, it should say Newton Avenue, is assigned to the anti-craft unit comprising part of the defenses of the island base of the South Pacific. Sergeant Dorn, who joined the Army in August of 1940, is one of three brothers in the Army that included Russell Dorn and Charles Dorn. So I had Pop and two of his brothers. Now I'm on the hunt. You know, what did Pop do? Where was he? Again, we didn't know. When I asked my father that question about, you know, well, what did Pop do? Meaning here in York. And it was, he was just a mechanic. I've learned to not use that word anymore, just. Because oftentimes it's reflective of people's circumstances in a certain period of time, not necessarily who they were or what they were or what they were even capable of doing. So dad said, Pop was just a mechanic. The first military records that I came across had Pop at Tuskegee. Dad, was, was he just a mechanic at Tuskegee? And he said, well, I don't know. So I kept looking. And then I found additional records where uh, he was then in Florida, I believe, I want to say it's MacDill, and I probably have that wrong, but I believe it was MacDill. And, uh, but the records were really odd to me because he was listed as being in the hospital for nine months with pneumonia. Who was in the hospital for nine months with pneumonia? And then he got a medical discharge. Why is that so important? I have health problems. A number of my cousins have health problems. And so now I'm like, Pop had something wrong with his lungs. But what did it say on those records for his rank? Aviation cadet. It did not say mechanic. So again, get away from just. That is a reflection of a moment. We have so many uh, at Lebanon Cemetery who folks my age um, know as, you know, being the homeless person downtown, being the drunk, maybe being the abuser, all of these other things. And we are finding these records where they were our leaders and they went off to war and they came home and like so many other veterans, there was no help for them. So again, we tried to get away from the word just. So in working with the folks with uh, the uh, Veterans Affairs, um, you'll see that my grandfather has a, a headstone. So his headstone is with my grandmother. And so we weren't going to uh, request it. In fact, they don't order. Uh, I don't have a headstone, they, they won't do the military headstone, but what they did do, uh, again, at no cost, he now has a World War II flag holder to make sure that his flag, again, um, stays in place in honor of his service to country. So I wanted to make sure that we were able to show this as well. The uh, picture up top, uh, this is my father, uh, and this was two months before my father passed away, uh, then Lieutenant Governor uh, John Fetterman came to take a tour of our cemetery and I was able to have him present my grandfather's flag order to my dad. So to be able to give him that, like I said, two months before his passing, that he had that for his father. Again, that's what this is about with the volunteering. Take a breather. <laughs> yes, it's very emotional. Uh, so we'll go ahead to the next slide here. Anybody ever heard of Port Chicago? I, you did. Yeah. I had never heard of it. Uh, I am not 
a historian. History was never something that I was into. I'm a math science person. I know numbers. And when I started volunteering here in 2019, it just opened up a, a new world for me because now I'm learning about family. And it was amazing because just instilling that extra sense of pride. And, and I said this in a recent interview where I was like, I come from greatness, period. And so many of us need to have that moment of reflection, getting away from the negativity. I'm gonna just pause for a moment. I have some water here uh, I wanna grab, so thank you. Actually, it's on the other side. What we have here, uh, I came across this newspaper article when I was uh, researching family. So on my, um, my dad's side, his mother, her family includes the Sexton family. So the Sexton family uh, out of Bamberg. And as I was researching some family members, I came across this article here where it was Sergeant Benjamin Sexton, of course, a family member. And he was visiting at home at the time, and it said 139 South Newberry Street. But then when I look over to the gentleman in the Navy uniform, it says he was at 139 North Newberry Street. So now I'm intrigued. Who is this? So I look, and it says here that we have gunnery made. Uh, it was Paul Walton the husband of Mrs. Mamie Lee Walton. Wait a minute. Mamie Lee Sexton was the sister of Benjamin Sexton. So this was their brother walt That's why it had the same address. And I go on down to the next paragraph, and it says that Paul Walton was among the uh, survivors of the Port Chicago, California explosion, which occurred on July 16, 1944, in which the lives of 400 or more shipmates, uh, excuse me one moment here. So we had 400 or more of the shipmates were lost. There were approximately 1,000 other people who were injured. Is when you read the articles and you look at the pictures, it said that this could be felt, I want to say it was like 13 counties around. So this is just north of the uh, San Francisco area. It was a huge explosion. But this is the part that gets me. They said he was one of the lucky ones and that he had minor injuries uh, to his back. There were some brush burns and cuts from the flying grass, uh, glass uh, from the surrounding buildings and the exploding ships. To be that close to that big of an explosion, what are the odds that there were minor injuries versus something like maybe speculating traumatic head traumas or just trauma period from experiencing this? Ears. The ears? Yeah. So I decided to figure out, you know, what was Port Chicago? I've never heard of it. The information that uh, we were able to pull up, and there are some, there are a number of videos uh, that are out there, even on YouTube, but there's been some documentaries over the years. And so we come back to this idea of the segregation. And <clears throat> Excuse me. So what it tells us is that all of the the, the workers, all of the, uh, the 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 it wasn't just Navy, but all of the um, I guess it would be like the privates and things. They were all black. The commanding officers were all white. This was before we knew about things like OSHA. This was where they were handling the munitions. They were handling the bombs, the ammunition, so on and so forth and we're not using proper techniques. And there was this huge explosion. Well, after this happened, there's maybe a week, a little more than a week that went past. And 
they had been, you know, cleaning up the area, not just debris, but bodies. And they were told that they had to go back to work. There was a war going on. We need to get these munitions overseas. And many of the people were fearful and they refused to go back to work. They were court-martialed and sentenced to 15 years. Minor injuries. Next slide, please. Mr. Sexton and uh, Paul Walton are both interred at Lebanon Cemetery. The gentleman that you see on the screen right now is not. But I wanted to bring up something in regards to the stories that we keep coming across as we are connecting people and seeing names. I see a name like John Davis, very, I don't know, basic, nothing about that says, you know, hey, Sam, look this person up. Except I start seeing his name with other people who are on murals in York, Pennsylvania. Who is this? So at age 17, Mr. John Davis, who was from New York, he became a world champion in the light heavyweight category in Austria, which made him the youngest contestant ever to win a world weightlifting championship. He never intended to compete in bodybuilding as he believed that African-American persons could never win the Mr. America title. So he continued his weightlifting efforts, which brought him two Olympic gold medals, 12 national championship titles, as well as eight world titles, championship titles. John Davis became the second person to total over 1,000 pounds and the first to do the clean and jerk of more than 400 pounds. Anybody ever heard of John Davis? John Davis moved to York, Pennsylvania to train at York Barber. Yes, sir. He's in the museum up here. I think there might be a picture. I think, there are in there. I think yeah, there's a there's a picture that has like five um, for so many John. So it was like John Davis, John Terry, John. I'm going to say his name wrong. I'm going to start with a B and everybody else is a bit more. Um, it's not far, but it's been like a barrel or something. Uh, so I apologize that I didn't get his name. But yes, in the picture with five, the uh, other gentleman that was there, we'll talk about in just a moment because it says Olympian John Terry. So with John Davis, during World War II, of course, he gets drafted. He goes overseas. Uh, and after he served, he was able to pick back up. And then I believe he held the title in 48 through, it's like 52, 54. The youngest at age 17. Checking on time here. Going to the next slide. This is Mr. John Terry, who's also in that picture with the, the five individuals. John Terry, was in the 1936 Olympics competing the same Olympics in Berlin where we talk about Jesse Owens. There were other Black Olympians there, including Mr. John Terry. And after the Olympics, he moved to York, Pennsylvania to train at York Fargo. So, just going to go over some of the information that I have here. Uh, John Terry is kneeling, uh, and he has the darker tie of, of the gentleman that are both here. That's Mr. John Terry. So he's well documented. He's in the picture at the Olympics. You can't say he wasn't there. He, um, and all of his records are out there. But we don't talk about that. When he moved to York, he owned property. He owned a, uh, they called it the, I want to say, Guy Man Cafe which was in the 100 block of West Princess Street where York High is currently located. That area around the school 
Uh, I do a Black history tour, a walking Black history tour, and that's one of the sites because all four sides of the building are relevant to York's Black history. That was essentially our Black Wall Street. That's where we owned businesses. That's where we had uh, church. And the cafeteria of the current high school is the original uh, foundation of the Smallwood School, the first school for colored children here in York. That is the original foundation is the high school cafeteria today. In regards to John Terry, some of the information that we see says that there was a lot of uncertainty about whether or not the United States should boycott the 1936 Olympics. He was born in Pittsburgh, so he had moved then uh, to New York to train. He was one of 18 Black athletes that would brave it and go to the Olympics in 1936 during the Jim Crow era. For many years, most of their stories were unknown, overshadowed by the performance of Jesse Owens. And while um, President Obama was in office, they did honor all 18 of those athletes. Finally, after the Olympics, John Terry continued entering weightlifting competitions all over the United States and worldwide in AAU competition. Mr. Terry moved to York, Pennsylvania in 1937 to become a member of the York Barbell Club. Numerous articles list John Terry as the strongest man in his weight class. What made John the strongest man was that he weighed only 132 pounds, but he was capable of lifting over 600. Anybody want to try? I'll do While living in York, he opened a restaurant, as I mentioned, there on West Princess Street. So another fun fact comes into this. The person who was managing the restaurant was a gentleman by the name of Paul Stevens. Ring a bell? Yes. And why would that be, sir? Played baseball and he was doing the Republican County on you know, Princess Street out around Phineas State is high school. Exactly, on, on Hill and Princess Street. So I grew up with Stevens Notary. Um, that's all I knew about Paul Stevens was Paul Stevens Notary. Here, Paul, Country Jake was how he was known, Stevens, was and is famous in the Negro Baseball League. That's who was managing. So these two stellar athletes were running this business on West Princess Street. I thought that was pretty cool. So what happened to John Perry? Why don't we know his story? The war. He gets drafted. After the war, he comes back to York. He marries, has two young children. And in 1950, he shot and killed his wife. Mm -hmm. Now all the articles then go on to talk about basically leading up to that moment that he was just never quite right when he came back home. And he was in a mental institution for four years. And then they had his trial and he was released. I can't read between the lines, just going with what happened. The very first thing that he did was petition the court to get his money and his property. And he bought a property at 139 South Newberry Street in York City. And he opened a youth center for boys and girls to make sure that they stayed out of trouble. That's the caliber of the man that he was. So while I cannot exonerate or, or make excuses for what happened, it was tragic. Who decides what stories should be told? To be able to call his grandchildren who I grew up with and tell them this part of the story before what happened, they didn't know that he was Olympian. And we were able to give them this information. 
His story is on our website, which is just the friends of Lebanon as well as uh, many of the other stories that we have here. Staying with 1915, we're just about finished here. We're going to go to the next slide. In order to get to 1950, I have to go back to World War I. Leon Gilbert Sr. is interred at Lebanon Cemetery in North York. He served during World War I. But some of the information that uh, we have, I, I quote him because, again, I just tried to put some context to who these folks were as individuals, as people. He was a blacksmith. We mentioned that he is a World War I veteran. He was a boxer. He was known as Kid the Boxer. And at one point, he also worked for the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Some of the newspaper articles here, um, the one here from 1912, 1912, just talks about his encounter with a horse, remember he was a blacksmith, and how the horse picked him. And it goes on to say that, you know, he walked a, a distance to get some help, and then he made his way home. Pretty nonchalant about it, but they listed all of this information in about getting kicked by the horse. There's a newspaper ad where it's, he's encouraging farmers to utilize his business, letting them know that he will come to them. He's going to make the house calls. He will come to them with his services. And then at the bottom, this was during the time of war. And it says that he served with the, it's on there, it's hard to see, I believe it's 300, 301st U.S. Stevedore uh, Regiment. And one of the things that it has in the article is that he wrote back home to tell one of the guys, I'm still boxing, and I even had to fight three guys in one day. That's what he said back home. CCC camps, I've never heard of them. Anyone? I think there was one in Gettysburg was one of the, the closer ones. Uh, so it had here about the CCC camp and how he was serving as the camp blacksmith and he'd been transferred then to Waynesboro uh, because they needed the services of a blacksmith. So I'm just learning all these terms and things because I did the, what is CCC camp? And I Googled it. I encourage you to Google it. For those of you that are watching from home, I know that some of our volunteers with the Friends of Lebanon are putting links in um, with these things, so you'll be able to pull those up. So Mr. Leon Gilbert uh, Sr. then was mentioned in 1950, 1951, where he was fighting for his son's release, Leon Gilbert Jr. Next slide. I want to see if I can bring something up here. Just bear with me for one moment. Yeah. So I'm going to walk through it so that we can get uh, to questions. So Leon Gilbert Jr. Uh, was a decorated soldier from World War II. In Korea, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and read down through some of this information, if you'll allow me. They're talking here about the 24th Infantry. Although the regiment accomplished many milestones during the war, one of their main struggles was confronting discrimination from white soldiers, and commanding officers in the United States Army. One such case was Leon, Lieutenant Leon Gilbert of York, Pennsylvania, a decorated World War II combat veteran who was court-martialed and sentenced to death for refusing an order from the 24th commanding officer in the fall of 1950. The order commanded Gilbert to return with 12 of his men to a forward position after they had been forced to withdraw because they were under heavy machine gunfire. Gilbert recalled in his letter to his wife, this would have caused me to draw fire not only from the enemy, 
but from our own troops. Not knowing who we were, they would have fired upon us. An entire company was ordered to attack that position later, but they had to withdraw. This is him telling his wife what took place that day. Says, I only had 12 men and no automatic fire. Because of Lieutenant Leon Gilbert Jr.'s refusal, he was arrested and he was tried on the spot without any witnesses. We've been able to look through transcripts and listen to tapes. And basically what the commanding officer said was, we had a war going on. We couldn't afford to let folks go and testify on his behalf. We needed them to fight. He was sentenced to death. After being accused of insubordination and cowardice, that's when they uh, laid the sentence. So the story gets even more involved from there. His attorney and the attorney for 18 other black men during that time was Thurgood Marshall while he was with the NAACP. Uh, if you know anything about the war, this was, uh, there's quite a bit about General MacArthur as it relates to Korea. And you'll see that information um, that's available. So, if you have an opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. and visit the African American Historical Museum, they have an exhibit about the 24th, and they even talk about what happened over in Korea. And years later, they pretty much exonerated the unit because all of the newspaper articles and things before listed those men as being cowards. And they changed that language. But they don't mention his name, not once. As those living members got older and were interviewed, they credited Leon Gilbert with saving their lives. Working to have his name pleaded. In regards to Thurgood Marshall and the tapes that we have, I was going to try and play one of the tapes, um, but we're uh, up on time. Just know that we have that information. You can get a lot of this. Uh, but one of the people that was interviewed um, from this time frame, he talked about the fact that, and, and I'm sure you guys, this isn't the first time you've heard it. Many people were sick. They were uh, having all kinds of digestive issues and things, you know, being overseas. And this gentleman says that he was in the medic tent uh, because he had internal bleeding from diarrhea. Okay? And he was so weak from all of the blood loss. And the commanding officers come in and they basically said, hey, you know, everybody's got to get back out on the line. You know, we've got a war to fight. But he was too weak to fight. He was court-martialed and sentenced to 15 years. How he got that reduced? They told him that they would dishonorably discharge him and he had to re-enlist and that come back in as a private. That's how he got out of his sentence. And there's so many stories like that. We honor all of our veterans. We are here to tell their story and to celebrate, not just in your county, but throughout our country. Going to the last slide here, for those of you here and those of you who are watching, we thank you for your service. If you didn't hear tonight is I believe the eighth anniversary of the All Vets organization here in York, Pennsylvania. These folks are doing great things. Look them up online, come to meetings. And if you can't physically be here, that's okay too because there's so much that can be done just through your support. Donations are always accepted. On behalf of the Friends of Lebanon Cemetery, representing not just Lebanon Cemetery in North York, but all of our cemeteries for African-Americans in York County, I thank you for having me here this evening. 
I encourage you to stop over before you leave. We have a display up and some books, including um, there's a full book there in regards to Leon Gilbert Jr. The information for Leon Gilbert Jr. has been scanned in with the York County History Center and will soon be available online. And last but not least, we are one of the sites for Reeves Across America. I believe also uh, Susquehanna Memorial Gardens is a site. Uh, this year, I'm pretty sure it's on December 17th. We're always looking for folks to come out to help lay Reeves, but right now we still need sponsors. You can go online uh, with our website. The information is there, and that will also then link you to other sites throughout the country, including Susquehanna Memorial Gardens. Uh, and I thank you. Are there any questions? You stopped at the cemetery earlier this year, and um, they said that the neighbor had some trees that had fallen on some of the graves. Has he ever cleaned that up? The trees are no longer on the graves. So you're able to do what you gotta do. We we are, are able to do what we need to do. Um, so, so the question or, or the statement uh, had to do with some damage that's been done at Lebanon Cemetery. So uh, just real quick, our cemetery is located on a hill. And when the land was first purchased, up at the top of the hill was cornfields and, and farmland. Now that there is a development there, we're getting all the water runoff. And so we have a significant amount of damage. And that's where I said, uh, when we uh, found uh, James Brown Talley's stone, that one was probably about two feet underground. We've had some even deeper, and they will continue to sink until we can do something with that runoff. That has also gone into an area not owned by the cemetery, but adjacent areas um, where there are a number of trees. Uh, I think last year was extremely difficult with the trees with the, uh, what are they, the, the spotted lantern. Uh, so now you can see that the trees are just a different color. Those trees in the storms are falling over into the cemetery property, landing on headstones, knocking over headstones. Um, and so we are looking for help um, with rectifying that particular situation as well. We've had a professional uh, management plan uh, that we commissioned to have done, and they estimate probably about $5 million um, needed over the span of a few years. Keep in mind, we have over 300 veterans at our site, but we do not receive one cent from the Department of Veterans Affairs because we are not a uh, veteran cemetery uh, per se. Mm -hmm. We're working on trying to get that changed and any support um, that people can lend for that, uh, not just at our site. This is a problem all across the country. Uh, we want to make sure our veterans are taken care of. Yes, sir. Is there a parking inside the cemetery? When you go drive, you put in the drive in the van, in the back zone, is there parking in there? We or do you have to park on the street. We do not have parking in the cemetery. Um, what some people will do, and in fact, what I would encourage, if it's a situation where you're just coming out and maybe there's just one or two cars, just the park off road, there's like a side road that comes down through that cars can still get around. So you can do that. Anytime we have the uh, preservation days, which are the second Saturday of every month, we are able to park in the church parking lot. As I said, Messiah has been a wonderful um, partner uh, with us. They've allowed us to utilize their facility for, for bathrooms or water or whatever it may be. I missed something really key. Uh, so I mentioned that last year we installed 12 new markers. We just put in two more um, less than two weeks ago. We had three more to put in. So uh, we are tentatively planning for November 4th of this year, which is a Saturday, uh, to be able to have a dedication ceremony uh, that would be at the property. So that information will be online as well. Yes, ma'am. Recent publicity about Prospect Hill alerted me to the fact that somebody owned Prospect Hill, which I never thought about. 
Does someone own Lebanon? Oh, that is some a group own. I mean, some. Do you know what I'm saying? Sure. And for so for everyone, uh, the question had to do with ownership. So when you get to a cemetery such as Prospect Hill uh, Cemetery, which is professionally owned and managed. And as I mentioned, they are a site that receives funding to take care of their veterans. Ours is a private cemetery. So when it comes to ownership, it is actually, it's, it's like a homeowners association type of thing. Back in 1872, a group of people who looked like me pulled their resources together, purchased a little under two acres of land at that time. We now have about five acres uh, and they set it up to have representation from the families to manage the cemetery. So that's why I, I equate that to kind of like a homeowner. Yeah. Uh, so there is an operations board that handles the day-to-day, -day, um, the maintenance or burials or anything like that. Our group, the Friends of Lebanon Cemetery, we're for preservation, education, we help with fundraising in support of those operations. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Sam, I would like to um, just say on behalf of North York Borough that we will extend any help that you need at the um, Lebanon, Lebanon Cemetery um, and anything that I can do, you can partner with me also to help this go since it's in our um, borough and it's so much history in there. So I'm just offering up whatever we can help. So North York Borough. Thank you, and thank you uh, to North York Borough. Uh, last year, uh, the borough in November, they declared uh, a Lebanon Cemetery Day. I just said November, it was actually August, um, and it would be this week, now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, this was Lebanon Cemetery Day because we're coming up on our anniversary, so it's 151st anniversary of Lebanon Cemetery is Monday. <laughs> this coming Monday, so this would have been a week last year to do that. Um, in in closing, as we're kind of like, you know wrapping things up, I do again want to mention on second Saturdays we are at Lebanon Cemetery, uh, probably at least through October weather, depending in November. But we want to make sure that things look good for Veterans Day, um, so we will come out. We invite folks and encourage them to do that. We recently also were down at Fawn AME Church there in Fawn Grove area. And I have their veterans book over here. Um, we will be back at Fawn, Fawn AME on September 30th uh, for doing the exact same thing. They have a number of USCT there as well. Uh, so, you know, everyone is encouraged to come out. Please check the website as well as the Facebook page for this information. And my final note is, believe it or not, I don't just pull history of our, our Black veterans, particularly if they're a bear cat. One's a bear cat, always a bear cat. So, you know, I post on our alumni page. Uh, so, you know, people will send me requests or um, if I come across some of these articles, I try to make sure that our Bearcat family is represented. Last question, please. Are there new flagpoles up yet? The new flagpoles are not up yet. Um, we do have them and they will be uh, in. When we do that, uh, we will be working with the Elks from downtown. I believe it's 213. Uh, so working with the Elks, uh, 213, we were able to get a donation of all new flags. The flags were tattered and torn. And again, just making sure that our veterans are taken care of. We have all of the supplies. We've just got to get out there and get them installed. When we do that, we're hoping that the Elks will join us uh, as well as with Post 127 uh, for dedication of those flags. Yes, sir. Uh, we have a question from somebody viewing online. Yes. Uh, so the question is, what can people do to support or advocate for Department of Veterans Affairs fulfilling their responsibilities to veterans buried in private cemeteries? Thank you. Uh, so the question has to do with the Department of Veterans Affairs. That's not just a York kind of thing. This is all across the country. And if we can, Ryan, if you don't mind going back to where we saw uh, the secretary in those words, I am determined that these will not just be words. 
So I can tell you that within the past week, I've received uh, information. The information is out there available where AmeriCorps is even now offering service project grants so that you can get those AmeriCorps workers not just there, but that they have the supplies to help. I would recommend reaching out to the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, I want to say, and we'll make sure that we put the information in. I believe it was just, it's actually Grace for Veterans, so it might have been info at Grace for Veterans, but we'll make sure we have that information. You can reach right out to the Department of Veterans Affairs in D.C., the National Cemetery Administration, let them know what um, cemetery uh, you're interested in working with. The one thing I do want to also say, please, 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 don't just go onto a cemetery that's private property and start cleaning stones. You need to get permission first. And we also want to make sure that we do no harm. Okay. Uh, and if anyone else has questions, reach out to us. Um, the email address is just info at friendsoflebanoncemetery.com. We thank you for your support tonight. We thank you for supporting our veterans each and every day. Have a good evening and be safe again. Yes.